Welcome and thank you for joining our Music for Global Change broadcast with founder and music ambassador Skylar Jett and presenter Tom Bryant and Ryan Shuchuk. And our special guest today is Patrick Allen. Welcome to the show, Patrick Allen. You are a director, producer, choreographer, dancer, singer and songwriter. You've worked with, well, loads of artists including uh, Luther Vandross, Justin Timberlake, Usher, John Legend, Prince and Amy Winehouse, to name just uh, a few. You grew up in LA training as a dancer and have had a, a dynamic career, become a renowned professional, appearing as featured dancer for Michael Jackson for the film Moonwalker and the Smooth Criminal films uh, as well. You were also part of Old Men Grooving, which is uh, abbreviated <laughs> to OMG, yeah. appearing yeah. on Britain's Got Talent, uh, becoming one of the most successful dance acts in the show's history. So loads more to talk about uh, with you there, Patrick. So thank you so much for joining us. And please tell us more. Tell me more. Tell me more. Was it love at first sight? No, uh, just, um, you know, even with doing all those things, there's always the next thing. You know what I mean? So. I'm a sing, singer songwriter as well now, and I write screenplays, and I'm shopping a, shopping a film right now, and oh, cool. we just, just launched a new music company in um, London with my business partner, Carlo Baker, called Music Box Live. Even though Music Box Live, I've been going with, with that brand since 1990 in Los Angeles. Okay, that but, started in uh, L- yeah, that started in LA, right? And then went to New York. Yeah, then to New York. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then to John to London with John Altman as my business partner. And uh, now we're moving on to d- different heights, and uh, we've got a new business partner, Carlo Baker. And we say our, our motto is bringing live experience with live music, and uh, it's really cool. It is really cool. What do you call it? The Monday Night Jams is Cyril's. Is that Music Box Live too? Yes, Music Box Live. That that's part of Music Box. But you do you do other clubs and all kinds of stuff. It's all under your umbrella, right? Yes. Yeah, so like like Mondays is the open mic night. Yeah. Um, other times it's all star jam session. Uh, then we have the music box live corporate band. We do functions, weddings, we do award shows. Um, and then like music box live, we produce a lot of. We're segment producers as well, so like okay. uh, there'll be there's a lot of award shows here for the Asian market, the Asian Trader Awards, the Asian Business Awards, the Pharmaceutical Awards, the GG2 Summit, the World Food Awards, you name it, and corporate, um, corporate uh, events. Yeah, corporate events, but they they have award shows. They give out awards to the best corner shop or the best new brand or um, athletes. We the Betzas, the British Ethnic, yeah, uh, diversity and sports awards, and mm-hmm. and where they give away awards to all the new athletes that are coming out, and all the big stars, the big famous athletes, give the awards to the young up and coming stars. Okay, my band will play, and Lenny Henry will be my co-host, or I'll be his co-host. And in his comedy skits, he does um, a lot of singing. Like he'll do um, "Let's Get It On" that kind of thing. So do skit. So yeah, my girl, and and on the radio came, and he'll sing with us. And he throws it to the band. You know, I I try to make sure the band is very diverse and versatile. And I've got like you know forty musicians to choose from. Actually, more than that. And one of our goals is to be the house band for a uh, talk show one day. Nice. That's, that's that's a good gig, man. Yeah, man. Blessing, blessings. Yeah. That's that's a I'll, good I'll gig. I'll be going to Let's Africa with Skyler. <laughs> there you go. You will be. We're all going, right? I'm, I'm right. working on stuff over there right now. You know, definitely we'll be going to Ghana. I know that. Perfect. I'm, I'm working on South Africa right now too, right? Oh yeah. So, yeah, yeah. and and I, and I have Rwanda as well because I I headlined. Uh, uh, a festival over there in Rwanda, uh, Kigali, the Kigali Festival. And man, the young people over there are so talented. When I go through Africa and I'm watching Africans, they're they're learning by the West. They study the I, West. Yeah. yeah. Right? And but they put their own flavor on top of it. The discouraging thing is, you know, it's a damn near billion people. It's fifty four countries over there. And yeah. The cold thing is there's no real industry for music in as much talent as they have, see? Yeah. 
and uh, shoot, what I want you to come with me because you can, you know talent. You, yeah, if, you, yeah. if you got four, if you got forty musicians on call, you know talent. It's amazing over there how um, distribution is a problem, so getting paid for your record is a problem, that kind of thing. But as soon as you sign a deal over here in the West, when they when they, when they take off over here, things really go will go well for them. But 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 initially they they can be a household name in their country where they are, and still yeah. still do okay, you know, for for what they have. So. <laughs> But um, I, I just yeah. I just imagine record labels over there. Yeah, I think there's just so the infrastructure isn't there. But but actually, the truth is what it is. It's it's our industry that wants to manipulate them more than the opposite. So that's right. That's right. Yeah, Tom, you got a question? Want... Yeah, well, lots of questions. Um, I want to talk a little <laughs> bit more about music um, music box live. But what was the uh, sort of driving force and, and main idea behind? why that was created and, what, and why you set that up what, what was your kind of process there oh well uh, i used to um well i started off as a dancer my mom wanted me to be a singer and then um just by default uh if i saw you walking down the street and there was a casting for a tv commercial and i thought you were right for it i said yo dude tom there's a casting for a tv commercial you're perfect you should go down the yeah. street and just tell him patrick's in here I'm like 16 years old doing this. And so I'd see you five years later. You're like, bro, I went to that casting. I got the job. I've been on TV ever since. I'm a household name. I'm like, what? I don't even know that it didn't even happen. You know, I never followed right. through. And then yeah. so um, I was on a couple of big talent competitions, Dance Fever. I won Dance Fever, a brand new car, $50,000 as a kid. Nice. Then um, I was on Star Search. But before I was on Star Search, I put the first dance team on there, two friends of mine. And I choreographed it, and they won a hundred thousand dollars, right? Mm. But the next mm. year, um, so because I was there with them every day, you know me, I have a personality, so I get to know everybody. So I knew the producers and the director and everybody. So I um, had some singer friends who wanted to go on there, and I said, "Oh, I, I know this guy. Let me see if I can get you on." And so the next year, I put the dance act on, the singing acts on, and they all won the finals. I'm like, wow. So the year after that, I was on with Cat, the girl from Prince, you know Cat, Cat mm -hmm. Glover, and then um, and on that year, um, we we were in the finals, and then she got asked to dance with Prince, and I got asked asked to dance with Michael Jackson, and then um, they would call me and say, "Do you have any singers? Do you have any dancers?" So I'd put dance teams together, singers together, we're taking an existing dance team and put them on the show, and if I put four dance groups on the show, they would all be in the semifinals. And if I put if I put four singers on the show, they would all be in the finals. And I don't know how it happened. It's just something mm -hmm. God gave me an eye. It became the agent. Producers you, like, you, yeah. My <laughs> producers like, how do you do that? I'm like, what do you mean? You got a you got an eye for talent. That's yeah, but at the same time, what they didn't realize is, you know, those divas, those big divas, you know, singers and stuff. You know, ask Skyler, he knows they don't want to do a talent competition. Mm -hmm. But no. if you do a TV show in Hollywood, it's AFTRA. So they're going to get $1,400. This is back in 1980 or whatever. They got $1,400 right. a week just for appearing on the show because they were in AFTRA right. already. So it's it was a job. Unit. So they said, well, yeah. this is a job. And if they say I yeah. won, it's an extra $500 in my bank account. Then if I win the finals, it's an extra $100,000. So these divas who were ph phenomenal singers that wouldn't normally do something like that would go on the show and just act like it was a job, no pressure, right? Yeah. And end up winning the whole thing. So it was Damn. pretty incredible. Yeah, man. And then so amazing. so in my during my tenure on the show, I I happened to put Britney Spears on, Justin Timberlake, Christina Aguilera. I've heard of them. Beyonce, Beyonce's yeah. Girl Time, <laughs> Billy Billy Porter, Beth Hart. The names are unbelievable wow. that, that came through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the funny thing is, I mean, and I used to choreograph the Mickey Mouse Club, but I didn't realize I had put Brittany and Justin and Christina on the show until someone, you know, investigated me and found out, oh, my gosh, during your time on there, you know, you, you put these people on the show. And I was like, really? Oh, wow. I mean, I knew about Beyonce's girls' time because I had to come into the office and explain to my producers that, listen, four little black girls or five little black girls rapping and singing like that is selling millions of records on the radio and i had to tell my producers 
you need to cast the show based on not based on your personal preference, but based on what's happening on the radio. Sure. That's right. Because I got them to change the category. The adult category was 21 and up. It's mm -hmm. like it should be 16 and up. It shouldn't be 21 and up. Yeah. So, um, yeah, if originally they had no kids on the show at all. And then um, based on that, we did a kids episode, a kids series of the show as well. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of fun. You're a star maker. Oh. Yeah, definitely. I'm a star maker. Yeah, I wish. That's all right. Brian, you got a question? I do. So I do want to hear more about. I checked out oh, the wait, website. Wait, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. So yes, the sir. reason why I started Music Box Live to answer his question, okay, is because I wanted to. I needed to give singers a forum. Mm. Yeah, where I where I could vet them and I could coach them and train them up. And so we started our. I started my first live nights with musician friends of mine who all got on to do great things. I mean, some of them have gone on. They were um, Alanis Morris's first band. Um, some of them got on to be Yogi Lanich's just a legendary guitar player in the, in the rock world. Um, and then um, my background singers went on to be the, one of the originals from the Broadway show Rent mm. and stuff like that. And then, um, but you won't believe this, I had Tupac in my show. He used to come down and rap when he was in Village under, I mean, in the uh, Digital Underground. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, Scott, I know Bonnie Boyer and those guys would come down through Cat and sit in. Michael Zambello was my producer at the time, so he came down and jammed with Jennifer Batson, who was a guitar player for Michael Jackson. My other producer was um, um, John Barnes Sr. He was the MD for Motown. So if okay. 50, in the 60s and 70s when Motown went out with like, you know, 10 of their acts in one show, they used one yeah. band, and he was the MD. He's actually, right. the, he's the guy who hired Quincy Jones to do Michael Jackson's album. He's the guy that hired wow. Greg Fillinganes to be the MD for Michael Jackson's tour. It's incredible. Wow. So, but that's why I started Music Box Live. And I called it Music Box Live because it had to encompass all genres of music. So if you came down in a box. country, Music Box Live, you could, you know, could be anything. Music. So. Yeah, yeah. But that's why hey, I started man, Music you Box You know, my favorite promoter of all time was Bill Graham. He had that eye and ear like you, you do. The way he did the Woodstock putting all those bands together, you know, yeah, yeah. and and the Fillmore's and all the stuff like that. He just had a knack for talent, man. And, yeah. you know, he put Santana's with Journey and Sly and the Family Stone. He, the insane thing is Huey Lewis and the News. So Huey Lewis gave me some tickets to come to one of their concerts. And I go, and then afterwards, you know, I had the backstage pass and I go back there and lo and behold, Bill Graham is talking to uh, Tony LaRusso, who was the, the Oakland A's manager, right? And oh, they're wow. talking, and, and I kind of mosey myself over there and stuff like that. And I meet him. I shook his hand, right? And and then and but he went back to talking to Tony after that. And I'm still standing there, and this, this guy comes up, and he goes, Bill, we're going to have to get out of here, man. There's a serious uh, uh, lightning storm coming, you know, shortly. So we need to get out of here. He left, and he had a he, he died in the helicopter. Oh no! Twenty minutes they, after I met, twenty minutes after I met him, he died wow. in a helicopter, in in, wow. a, in in a lightning storm. Right? Wow. Insane, insane man. But he was the best of all time. You know, promoting. You know, he just the needed talent. Yeah. He was probably doing a deal for the stadium to do a concert or something. Oh There's man! Everywhere. Yeah. That that was a the the uh, Woodstock was out, out in a farm. I know. It yeah. ain't had it ain't had no walls on it. You know. All right, go for your your question. Oh no worries. I'm just going to continue sorry. on with uh actually with Music Box Live. So I checked out the website, and I, I mean I looked at your Instagram and and it looks like a party that I want to come to. It's uh, insane. A lot of videos on there, but I guess when I looked at the website, it was interesting because you know it looked like. It was you do the booking with the artists, you can do the catering of the event, you do the promotions and all the PR and stuff. Like, what was the um, sort of idea to just sort of be an all-in-one solution instead of, you know, just focusing on one one aspect of, of the events? Because that's what I mean. That's why we bring experiences to live music, something like that. Yeah, that's my partner Carlos Martin. The thing was is that um, he is an expert in all things small events 
Okay. Where I do big events. Look, I've got not too many after my glasses. And um, he, he has a concierge company. So he does big designers like Laura Piana, Victoria Beckham, Fendi, mm. you name it. He does all these. And he does their showrooms. And what he does is he, he when they have the sheik coming in from Saudi Arabia and they close the whole shop, he provides the hors d'oeuvres, the drinks, the hospitality, the butlers yeah. who wait on everybody. So it's like a luxury event, too, exclusive type of stuff. Yeah, so we realized, wow, he needs musicians sometimes. And then, uh, and I produce, produce some big events sometimes where mm. I, I do the whole business. And he has expertise in that, so we thought, oh, the synergy there, this could really work to bring that kind of a product with the full band, with the greatest artist you've ever seen, yeah. up and coming, whatever, you know what I mean? And so it makes for a good package. It's a really good, co cool concept, yeah. I was like, wow, okay, yeah. they do it all. Do it all. Yeah, yeah. So we can, we can be a one-stop shop, you know? Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Hey, hey, Tom, you know, it was Patrick that introduced me to uh, Yolanda. <laughs> Right? Oh, really? Okay. Yolanda Charles, he, he introduced yeah, yeah. me to her in L.A. Uh, she okay. was over there just jamming with another sister, the singer. And then uh, I, I also met John Altman through Patrick. Mm. All these people yeah, but, that we've had on our previous shows, aren't they? Right. Right. All right. Yeah, people want to take, take a look. They've, uh, they've appeared before on our little show. Good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> man. I, you know, I call him the mayor. He's the mayor of... <laughs> the mayor of... <laughs> Of music in London, right? I mean, yeah. he's a directory. I mean, I need a trump player. He has about fifteen of them right here. I need a drummer. <laughs> you know. So it's one stop shopper with Patrick. I love him so much. Man. It's cool. All I the down, uh, I go down. Schools. I go down and support him on Monday nights. You know, because yeah, it's, right. it, it's a it's a little tiny place. Hey, Patrick, do you remember that place called the Baked Potato? Of course, yeah. On, yeah. on Ventura. That's on Hawaiian and Ventura, yeah, yeah. It's about the same Baked size, potato. huh? Uh, probably smaller. The baked yeah, potato was small. smaller. The baked potato. No, churros. Churros smaller. Yeah. Oh, so oh, churros are smaller than baked. I think potato. might be a little okay. smaller. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there, there's a there's a jazz venue, a very famous jazz venue on Victor, Victoria Boulevard, and it's where all the heavyweights go. That's mm. where they that's where they go <laughs> hang out. To jam mm, yeah. or anything. Same thing with with Patrick's place on Monday. That you you might see anybody come up in here. They're all talented people. I, I I have a ball just looking at new talent when I come to London. You know. Yeah. Yeah, bro. Wow. Yeah, we had um, Janet Jackson. She didn't get up and sing, but we had Johnny Gill. We've had all the Osbournes. But yeah, Lizzie Lohan. She sang some um, Fleetwood Mac. Oh, she wow. wants to oh, love yeah. the lead singer. Stevie Nicks. Stephen X, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Damn, we we on a game show right I'm now. On it right we're winning now. all go. the money. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> so we had Jess Jess Glenn sing. We had Emily Sandy. Those are British artists. Mm. Yeah. Um, and all sorts. We get Shalimar down there all the time. We get now whole Nile Rogers whole band, all the singers and everything. Damn, Tom, you got a question? Well, I'm just in absolute awe of all the people that you've worked with. And, and yeah. kind of, you know, yeah. To me, if yeah. it were me, I'd be pinching myself constantly, scrolling through my phone going, oh, my, my word, I know all these people and I contact these people so regularly. Um, what I would oh, like to, to, uh, I would like to touch on, I mentioned it um, just slightly earlier, the, the appearance um, and, and kind of decision, I suppose, to go to Britain's Got Talent with the, uh, the old men grooming. What was, the, what was your kind of... Um, thoughts behind that, and and you know how was it, and kind of you know, obviously you 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 were deemed one of the most successful dance acts they've actually ever had, so that must have been quite quite an accolade for you. But um, how was that? Well, we did a an advert on television here for Sainsbury's, which is like the um, the Ralphs of oh, the equivalent of Safeway. It went viral, and it was for ugly Christmas jumpers. Which are ugly Christmas sweaters. Mm. You know, every Christmas dads get ugly sweaters. Yeah. So yeah. we played the dubstep dads and we did like a, a hip hop routine <laughs> with some popping in it, right? And we, we entered our kids' talent competition in the, in the advert and we win. And um, so the advert went through the roof, 20 million views. And um, 
Sainsbury's jumper sales went up by 120 percent. Yes. Right? Damn. <laughs> what? So Sainsbury's you they can... started putting us on all the TV shows and stuff. And I knew the guy. I, did, did, I, did they I did pay? You, did they pay you for that? In jumpers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. In rompers. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, the advertising agency did. Yeah. Wow. But we, okay. But the thing is, so we were casted. We 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 were asked to come individually. I didn't know the other guys. I, I only yeah. I only knew one of the other guys. And so um, we were casted individually, and it was going to be us with some moms and that kind of thing. And they mixed and matched and decided let's just do all men. And then my friends from Britain's Got Talent saw it, and they were like, oh, we want you to come on Britain's Got Talent. And I was like, no way. I said, I've done all the competitions I'm ever yeah. going to do. Yeah. Then um, we were doing Good Morning Britain live. So my friend Barney, who's from Britain's Got Talent, he saw us on their lives, so he thought, let me call them now. And he knew I was with the guys. So he called me, and I was like, oh, no. And he goes, ask the guys. So I asked the guys, and they all said yes. So I was of like, course. all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so we did it. And we didn't think, you know, like, it, there's nothing contrived about it. We didn't want well, to. Why would it be? You know, that's what I mean. So concept. we could have. It's a great concept. You know, I, 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 I'm saying, but I could have never said, take that old guy who looks Chinese and that old guy who's 64, and this guy who looks older, but he's only 40, and this guy, and then me, right? The, the chubby guy. And I could have never done that and said, this is going to work. It was just, it was put together randomly that in other words you can't it's, it's, it's just amazing how it happened how long did you have to rehearse for that oh not long yeah we're all dancers so yeah, this guy's well, professional well we did dance for a little while we rehearsed i guess we rehearsed a bit because one of the one of the older yeah. gentlemen is isn't that great yeah like, so we would just hide him in, in between us <laughs> <laughs> yeah because he could, he could pick up the moves, but yeah. he just couldn't yeah. really execute them. So we, we just couldn't believe it. And then Britain's Got Talent, America's Got Talent tried to copy what we did. Oh, really? And the, and the hilarious thing is they used dancers of mine. And two, like oh, two of my wow. best friends. From the States. They used some, yeah, they used some of my best friends to choreograph it. But the thing is, see, the, my advantage was living over here, British, British people take the piss out of themselves. Yeah, and they like to have a laugh at their own mm -hmm. expense. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, and they're the kings of sarcasm. So we weren't we weren't out there trying to be yo. We're, we look like we're twenty one. You know, we were like, hey, you're we to fake it. yeah, well, don't leave me behind. Well, I can catch up, you know. And whereas the guys in America were like, yeah, we're serious, man. We're gonna slow down. And, and it was like, nah, it didn't work. But they really wanted it to work so bad. Uh, I guess because Simon, you know, must have really thought, oh, we can have an American version of us. Mm. So even though they, they didn't get through to the finals, they have a wild card on the show. So they booked them for the one and put them in the finals anyway. Mm. So the guys come to the show and um, these are my friends. I shouldn't be saying this. I hope they don't see it. But I guess they hadn't rehearsed enough or whatever. They had this really complicated chair routine because one of the guys in the crew is the guy from the Janet Jackson videos who choreographed all the chair routines, right? Okay. Yeah. And so they had this chair routine. It was like, it was they, they only have two minutes, and it was about forty seconds, and it was so complicated that one of the guys got off the beat, and uh -oh. you, you could never figure it out again after that. Once he got off the beat, because it was like a uh, a dominoes effect or whatever. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So that yeah, it ruined right. the whole thing, and they couldn't catch up. And they got, oh, they got buzzed off the show. Ooh. The only acts ever to be buzzed off of the finals. He, he must he must have felt like, yeah. God damn. Yeah, what's his Instagram? Guy. I'm just kidding. No, that's not yeah, yeah, so. uh, uh, you, you got, Ryan, you got to see that video, Old Man. Yeah. Old Man, what's, what's called Old Man what? Old, old Man Grooving. Old Man Grooving. Old, you, you, All right, I'll check You got to see that video. Now, that video from my song, Dance like I'm losing my mind. Patrick's in that too, coming down the escalator. That's Patrick getting off, and everybody goes, "Who was that?" I don't care what, whoever, whoever I'm playing for. Who was that, brother? Right? <laughs> I, I, I love that shit. That's cool. Yeah, <laughs> that was cool because that was at um, the big shopping mall here, Westfield, during, during yeah. the pandemic. So it was empty, not a soul mm -hmm. in sight. And you can come down, no problem. 
get your groove yeah. on. You know, you know what I mean? Wow. Tom, you got another question? As I, as we've already said, you, you've worked with so many um, so many people and so many different artists. Is there a standout personal persons that you think, wow, I managed, I was able to work with this person or you always <laughs> wanted to work with this person and you managed it? And secondly, what's next? What's coming up for you? Right. Well, initially, I guess uh, my first hero, well, was Michael Jackson. Yes. Works. Now we're talking. Definitely. Now we're talking, Rick. But when really? I look back, it was getting my makeup done next to Whitney Houston mm. and asking her to marry me. I was only 16 or whatever. And um, <laughs> she had never, nobody knew who she was. It was her television debut on Soul Train. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I got to ask her to marry me. So I was like, what? I look back on that. I'm like, and then I was doing the American Music Awards a few years later. And um, this is hilarious. Because, you know, Whitney, she was kind of ghetto. But people didn't realize it at first. She was very, very, you know, polite. Astute and everything, yeah. And as, as, but in the later years, you know, it came out her, her real personality, you know, kind of, you know, child don't mess with me, that kind of, you know. Yeah, the yeah. Roll and all that. And um, so I was doing the American Music Awards, and I hadn't seen her for a couple of years. And she was getting all these awards. And she kept, her, her and Robin were sitting in the front row. Cause she was about to come up and get an award. And then she kept pointing at me, right? And after we finished the number, all the dancers were like, Whitney Houston's mad at you. She's going to get you. I was like, what are you talking about? Uh -huh. She kept pointing at you. And I was like, oh, no. And then <laughs> she came up to me backstage, and she dropped the N-word. She said, N, where yeah. I know you from? I was like, I asked you to marry me. That's right. I said I asked. I said I asked yeah. you to marry me at Soul Train. She goes, Oh yes! Oh my God! That's funny. And she was so cool. And Bobby Brown was standing right by us. They didn't even know each other. And a few years later, they're married. Wow! First record I ever did with Whitney. So we're about to take a break. You know, they they order some Chinese food. And we're, we're about to go out and have something to eat now. And so we start walking through the control room, and I I had left my my little sweater because we're getting cool. So I, I went in there, and when I got in there, she was spit swapping like crazy with this woman. Whoa! Was Robin? I don't know who she was, but they was. I mean, they wouldn't. When I opened the door, they was, they just kept going. I was damn okay. This is before Bobby yeah. Brown, though. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Bobby Brown was a was a marriage of convenience anyway. But what yeah. happened? What they didn't expect was for them to have that person that addictive personality. It made them just fall in love that way. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, I feel bad for Robin, but yeah, no, this, I got some stories about Whitney, but I'm not going to say it online. But, no, no, I, I'm just saying. Yeah, I, you guys I'm are dropping exclusives my, right now. My, I, I, I've been on two records with her, and, you know, if I, she, that, was, that was the first one, right? And yeah. so, I, we, we, but I mean, I've been, in, I've been in the studio with her. She just, she was phenomenal, but I we bet, had some. Yeah. We had we had some we had some great background singers doing all the parts when I did when I did uh, I'm I'm every woman and um, man come on bro. I mean we had we had I was in the crew of singers in the Bay Area mm. that we did all the records right and sometimes we show up we don't know who we singing with today yeah it could yeah. be any it could be anybody anybody you know Neil Sedaka Tom Jones uh, Stevie or Sting doesn't matter. <laughs> you don't know. That's they just take you show up. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. Come man. get that that's check. Why on, that's, that's why I'm on 2,500 <laughs> records. Man. It's crazy. We didn't ever know who was gonna be working. And then I I left Narda and moved Walter yeah. moved with Walter, and Walter started paying me triple scale. <laughs> I'm out. Move, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Come on, man. Then I, then we start doing like I said. Uh, I did a, a tune with Tom Jones, and you know, it was man. I, I mean, these God, the money that these people, them, them <laughs> the them them the biggies. When you get to that one, that's international money, right? Yeah, yeah. He yeah. big, he, he big on both sides, right? So, yeah, man. Even, even today, you know, the the young artists coming up, musicians and sing BBs, background singers, man, they do these young acts. And they're on two fifty a show or whatever, and then some. Sometimes maybe five hundred pounds a show. Yeah. And then they get Tom Jones or they get an Annie Lennox. They're on eight nine hundred a show, and they can't believe it. They're like what? 
Yeah. So the labels yeah. are really because of the 360 deal. Yeah. Labels yeah. are paying musicians cheaper and cheaper yeah. and cheaper. Peanuts. They pay. They paying them. Peanuts. Some yeah. of the musicians are still making money, the same money they made 30 years ago at a club. Yeah. Ooh. Yep. You know that that that's why I went off on them, because, you know, if you take the music out of a nightclub, it becomes a bar or a restaurant. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. I, I, the, uh, you know, people come out to see music. They're going to eat and they're going to they're going to drink. Yeah. I, I asked my buddy. I said, "Man, how much is one fifth of liquor wholesale?" He said, "The house stuff." I said, "Yeah." He said, ten dollars." I said, "How how much you make off one bottle?" He he said, "One hundred and twenty." Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now. You know, if they paid a band five hundred or whatever, you did a little band, right? They didn't pay you. They paid you off with three and a half bottles. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a damn shame. And then the the the, the waitresses they make more money than, <coughs> than, than, the, than the musicians, and the musicians is making everybody drink. There's something wrong yeah. with that picture. I was in the band. Drink. I would just I would just pull up and sell liquor. How about that? At the front of the at the front of the stage. It's only a building. It was right. there before we got there. It's gonna be there afterwards. So it's what you They've do got with a license. it. Can't do but but there's people out here that have licenses. You can bring them up for, for one night, right? Oh, see, you can see, theory, my, yeah, yeah. What what my plan was when I got here, and I didn't see a lot of it, but a bunch of empty buildings, right? So you can go. Okay, so. Ten thousand dollars right there. If you if somebody goes out and have three drinks mm. at seven dollars, and that's twenty one dollars. You know what okay. I mean. And if you got five hundred people in there, twenty one times five hundred is ten thousand dollars. So when you look at it, if I can go to bands and say, "Hey man, let's get this building," you know, if you you can go to the uh, you can go to, for twenty five grand. Twenty-five grand. Say, say, say you're going to see three bands. And you pay twenty-five dollars to get in, right? I mean, the DJs are making more money than that. Millions. Right? Yeah. Oh, that, that's a damn shame to me. Hey, hey, hey musicians, when you go get finished with that, so I can, I can make my money, right? I know. <laughs> yeah. That's some, that's some sick stuff. But anyway, if you got, if you got, you made twenty-five thousand dollars. See, if I went to somebody now that had an empty building. And I go, how would you like to make six thousand five hundred dollars tonight? The bu- the building's empty, right? So all three bands will make six thousand five hundred dollars. So you got four four you got four entities making six thousand five hundred dollars. That's twenty five thousand dollars, right? So now you go get all your f- fans, and Ryan go get all his f- fans, and Tom go gets all his fans. And we put them in a room together with twenty five for twenty five dollars. Yeah. And they go, whoever comes on first, say, hey man, have you seen my buddy Patrick's man? He coming on next. No, I stick around for that, right? We're paying each other this way. Six thousand five hundred dollars. Get one room to got a that can hold a thousand people that pays twenty five dollars, right? We're in. Yeah. And so. Uh, th- this way, you take it away from the clubs, club owners. Like I say, it's just a building. You take it away from them because they don't want to pay you any money. And still today, yeah. after all these years, they want to pay you the same thing they was paying when I was when I was a teen playing music. Right. Right. That that that's the part I don't like. And, and they don't want to give you none of it. Right. The the the, the food the the food part or the or, or the liquor, and, and you because of you. And I like this part when the club owner go, "Hey, man, go tell all your friends, come on down." Right. Really? They'll make me money. I, I'm a, yeah. I'm a promoter now. You go pay me for that, right? These are my fans. <laughs> so that's why I bring all the bands together, and we do it together. Now we paying each other. Now, now we help each other getting paid. So say it's six thousand, uh, sixty five hundred dollars. But everybody take out. I don't care if you take fifteen hundred dollars a piece out, and you can get. Some good sound. You can get some kind of sound. Yeah. And lighting yeah. and stuff like that. But my my only problem I was having was 
uh, insuring the place. Mm. So my, my thing is to go after an insurance company and say, hey, man, will you insure this building for one night? And you can do all the advertising yourself, what it, put posters up, whatever you want for, you, for one night. Just insure it. You know, because I, I don't want to get in there and then somebody burn the, burn the place down. That's got to be on me. So that's been my only thing is get, mm. get, get to that point where I can get insurance. And, and then, well, it's licensing and then we, doing all that. So. Huh? It's licensing, licensing, you have a license, you got to be the owner. It's so much red tape now. Yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, but back you if you if you look back in the the the, the juke joint, joint yeah juke joint day they went and got a, a barn back in the right? woods yeah <laughs> they got somebody that can pour some pour some beer and stuff like that and people yeah. would show up in suits to a barn and get off right they wasn't <laughs> yeah. waiting on no club owners it's just a it's just a structure man yeah. it's what you do on the inside of it you know yeah they Try to manipulate the hell out of everything. Troy, there's so yeah, much red right. tape. Right. This right. You got another question for Yeah. No, it, it won't. It won't happen here. Why? No, this thing happened in the UK when I first got here in 1999. Yeah. Um. Um. Nobody realized it, but well, anyway. So I was doing the ten room. It was the big night I did over here with John Altman, and um, mm -hmm. a huge VIP club. And downstairs was. Just, Another big VIP club called China White's private membership clubs. Anyway, okay. um, so there was about ten clubs in the West End, and uh, and we were booming. I had Jay Z, I had all the big stars coming through every week, and so so. Um, anyway, long story short, this guy named Reggie Reggie opened up. He was he used to run Cafe de Paris, so he knew mm -hmm. the owners, the owners' kids, and he, and he said, "Hey, I want to do my own club." So I said, "Oh, we've got a club. It's in the basement." Of this building, and um, it has been open in twenty years. Oh wow! Right what, back what, in the what's day. The, what's the what's the capacity? Or thirty years even, uh, probably three hundred people. Okay. So um, they told him. I said, "Look, you can go on my dad's existing license because in London you, you have to go on the existing license that's there." Okay. And uh, here's they, they gave him ten grand and said, "Here, do an aesthetic makeover. Mm -hmm. Nothing permanent." Open your doors, and when you start making money, you can pay us rent. Hmm. So he was like, "Cool, man." So because he was a famous bartender and in the club scene, he let everybody know the deal he got. And it turns out there were thousands of derelict clubs from the '60s and '70s in his basement <laughs> wow. in London. Mm -hmm. So then yeah. a, a year later, there were now like 20 VIP clubs and 100 clubs. Mm -hmm. Three years later, there was literally six seven eight hundred clubs in central london yeah. that you're just going Damn. what clubs. fight clubs and I, i'm probably exaggerating all those numbers but it was just, <laughs> it's ridiculous yeah. and yeah. now like when you walk down one of the streets in soho you will walk past 30 clubs basement and upstairs basement mm -hmm. upstairs and nobody knows and, they're uh, there no they do now yeah, yeah but they did it they did it back then Mm -hmm. The guy let the cat out of the bag. I, I'm talking about I'm talking about warehouses, though, right? Mm. Oh no, warehouses. Yeah, that that used to happen. They used to do raves at warehouses. Sure. Yeah, house, that's what I'm saying. If you, if you can get a thousand people in there, they pay twenty five dollars to see three bands. That's a great night, you know. And and, and the musicians make more than they play yeah. making a club. Yeah, we should put that together. It's, it's, it's been to. thirty years since the raves used to happen. Now. A yeah, that's see, years. that's the part that killed me, man. The DJs, man, they got headphones on, bobbing and weaving their head, lights going Play crazy. Maybe some, music. Yeah. making making may way more money than all musicians trying to get on stage, trying to make a living for their life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hey, hey, man, hurry up, get that record done, man. I I, I got to work tonight. What? You didn't pay <laughs> for the studio. You didn't pay for nothing, right? Cold blooded, man. It's wrong. And all the sampling, remember all the sampling? God. Oh man, oh, yeah. yeah. That's why I love. I loved. I sang on a. Uh, I sang on a duet with uh, James Brown and, and Aretha Franklin, right? And all right. That was that was after he. No, that was before he went to jail. Remember that? Right. Oh wow! Yeah. He went wow. To jail. Okay. So so what what happened was when he got out of jail, the first thing he said, "I want to thank all of my attorneys." 
Okay. Because he went after all them bands that sampled his voice. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. He made a mint off that shit. They thought he was yeah. gonna be gone forever and, and, and you know, in jail. But as soon as he got out, go get him. Go get him. anybody had James Brown on their record, yeah, he sued him. He had to pay those for those attorneys. Yeah. That's you right. Know. That's right. Yeah, well plus so he's because of James Brown, it set a precedence. Right. And now they had to they had to figure out how the ways to you know the scheme or whatever it is, if, if you sample the record, you can let the label know and you automatically will pay this much. If it's if you want to get it, if you want to do a split, you gotta contact us. Otherwise we get hundred percent of the publishing. Mm. It's cold blooded, man. Now listen, like before I was we gonna go, do a remake of Love Story and they wouldn't let me have anything. Or brand new lyrics, everything. Oh yeah. Just use the music, right? Oh the music yeah. too? Yeah, wow. But they use before, their music Different lyrics for love story, you know, and they wouldn't let us have it. One one point. They they wanted some money. They want some serious cash. Hold on. Yeah. Before we go, I have to ask you this now. Who, who were some of your favorite social conscious music writers and producers? Uh, definitely Marvin Gaye. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, maybe um, Cat Stevens, Yusuf Islam. Mm. Oh wow! Because I toured with him, you know. Yeah. And uh, I think he's got a Nobel Peace Prize for. Wow. For that, I don't know if Crosby, Stills, and Nash were that way. Yeah, they they did social action music, but. Yeah. Yeah, Bob Marley definitely. And um, John Lennon, Curtis Mayfield. Yeah, John Lennon, Curtis Mayfield. Wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah, man, there's a there's a whole lot of them. that's what music for global change is about. Is because they've been some of the most powerful songs on on earth. I mean, with Mar Marvin Gaye doing the What's Going On album that basically helped stop the Vietnam War, and, right. along with you know uh, John Lennon and, and Imagine, right? And then you got Bob Marley talking about the struggle. Uh, Nina Simone, she was one of the first ones out there. And then Definitely. you had uh, uh, Gil Scott Heron. You know, they, they, it was all around social consciousness and, and it made them famous, but there's never been an industry. And that's what uh, we're trying to build right here is like uh, yeah. festivals and radio and records. Because when I ask people, I say, how many? Compared to the love songs, how many social conscious songs have you written? And it's always a handful, yeah. right? And, 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 and they know there's no way for them to uh, promote it because there's no labels and stuff like that. So the, all these conversations that we've had, we're almost at 70 guests now. And they're always yeah. asking the same question, you know, what's your opinion about social conscious music and where do you see the benefits? For the society, well, I me, mean, I think it's the mainstream uh, machine that blockades most of that work because That's right. they're anti and they're they're causing all the social problems, so yeah. climate warming and all that, which doesn't exist anyway. That's my opinion, and uh, they've made a fortune off of it, you know. Because if you believe in climate change, well, tell me why does Leonardo DiCaprio and all the other 800 guests take private Lear jets to Davos every year. They fly mm -hmm. on a private Lear jet to, to the climate change convention and they give all this preaching, but they're not, they're not living up to it. They're not living by it. So that's what, you know, it is the plan. You know, they just, they just tore down the Georgia Guidestones. And if you don't, okay. if you don't know what the Georgia Guidestones are, look it up. You'll be shocked. Those two things. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. And look, look up Vanguard and Black Rock. You will, your mind will be blown. Your mind, yeah. will, if you know Vanguard and BlackRock are, Vanguard and BlackRock are the two financial institutions that own every mainstream industry built a corporation in the world. From mm -hmm. the food industry, to the education industry, to the medicine industry, to the pharmaceutical industry, to the computer industry, right? And, and they own all of them. Now they make it look like they're in competition so one side is Pepsi Cola, mm -hmm. the other side is Coca Cola. If you go to any town center, if you go to Shanghai, what do you see? Coca Cola, one side, Pepsi Cola, the other side, McDonald's, one side, 
KFC to the side, Starbucks in the middle. Uh, you know, you see Shell, Exxon, all those, right? You yeah. see Apple, you see Macintosh, um, and you know what I mean? And I don't want to go to China to get a Big Mac. I want to go to China to get some fried rice. I don't want to go to <laughs> Africa to get a Big yeah. Mac. I want to go to Africa to get some jollof rice. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I don't want to go to Japan. And I, this is, I, I was in Japan in the 80s. And all you saw is McDonald's and KFC, McDonald's everywhere, you know. Mm, yeah. And um, so they've really cornered the global market, which proves that. And the thing is, they're they're they make it look like they're um, competition, but they're in a, what's called a circular business, circular business mm -hmm. deal. So they're all profiting off of each other. So Apple and all those other computer companies are are, are actually actually making money off of each other. Yeah. And competition. Yeah. Competition is good because you're going to make more money. Sure. And uh, so they have a, mon a monopoly on almost everything. And you're right. Well, we have to stop supporting them. I've been waiting almost an hour to talk to Patrick, the star maker, Allen, about. About? Yeah. I want to talk two, three hours, sir, about Smooth Criminal video. <laughs> oh, yeah. Come on. You were in the Smooth Criminal video sure. when that album came out, Bad Moonwalk Videos. I was Michael Jackson for like six years in a row for Halloween. We're going to extend this episode for 13 hours straight. I want to know every detail <laughs> about the Smooth Criminal video. Go ahead. What Never stop, Never stop talking. Go? Go ahead. And go. Everything about the Smooth Criminal video. What was it like making that video? What was it like? Where are you leaning? Did you do the lean? Was that you? Yeah. Please tell me it was you. Yeah. It's an amazing story. Um, there's a delay now, so you have to just get used to it. But, Fair enough. But uh, my flatmate was... Um, Stevie Wonder's right hand man. He used to walk Stevie Wonder onto the stage and off the stage. Okay. Andre Cleveland, who was Reverend James Cleveland's son. And uh, I had done Star Search and everything. I told you that's how I got Michael Jackson. Right. So he was my flatmate, my roommate. And, um, and I was singing in the bathroom. He goes, Patrick. I said, What? He goes, You want to dance with Michael Jackson? I said, Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he goes, What kind of question is All right. that? Yeah. All right, I need, I need you to come to a meeting tomorrow. I said, okay. So we went to a meeting in this big building that um, you, you, everybody recognizes this building, but you, you didn't know who was in it. It was very similar to the Solar Records building. Yeah. And, uh, but it was on La Cienega at the top near, near Sunset Boulevard. Yeah. And a high-rise building, but only about 10 floors. Anyway, so the meeting was there, and the whole build, build, building was MJJ Productions and, and MJ's management at the time okay right and um so i went there and they had a meeting and they said listen we're doing a new video for michael and we need to audition all the street dancers so um and they said andre said you're the man for the job and um we saw you on star search and all those kinds of things. i said yeah great so i had to get flyers out as far as arizona and oh, wow. oakland california to all the dancers, all the street, because I was in charge of the street dancers. Okay. And so we got all the flyers out, and the audition was like two weeks later or whatever. And there must have been a thousand street dancers in a queue, Damn. in a line, okay. waiting to audition. So I had to make up a routine, a popping routine. You see me popping? You can't see it, but. And, um, uh, and I made up a routine, and I had to teach it to all these people. It was supposed to be like an eight-hour day. It was more like a 15-hour day. Whoa. Damn. And, and we went four, four at a time. And so we each each four had to do the routine. And I had to do, I had to teach it to them and then dance it with them, right? And so by the end of that day, it was actually two days. I was so exhausted. I bet. But um, it was like, they said, great yeah. job, Patrick. Great job, you know. That was like, so that was October. And then 88, uh, I guess. Then um, we were supposed to start a few weeks later, right? And no phone call, nothing. December comes. I'm talking to Jeffrey. Dad, well, I'm talking to Andre. And he goes, I don't know, man. It's happening. No, it's still happening. I'm like, okay. So then on January 29th, 1989 or 88, whatever it was, I got a phone call saying, Patrick? I said, who is this? It's Bob Jones. Oh, hey, Mr. Jones. He was the producer of yeah. Smooth Criminal, the Moonwalker. He said, well, we start next week. Are you ready? I was like, no way. Today is my birthday. Nice. 
He goes, sure, happy sure. birthday. So on my birthday, they called me and said, it's a done deal. And um, Well, that's a nice birthday present. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. And so we started working on it a few weeks later, whatever. Then the lean. So I was doing a special effect, which was the lean. Okay. And I was throwing, I was the guy throwing the money at Michael mm -hmm. when he's on the stage, doing the dance on the stage with the girl with the saxophone. And um, Michael Jackson saw me doing the lean. And well, well, I'll tell you, well, before that, just so you know. So there were Wait, 18... he stole the lean from you, man? Oh, yeah, yeah. He stole, stole the lean? Yeah. Another yeah. exclusive. Perfect. Well, I, I, wait, wait a minute. How much you pay him for that? <laughs> how much How much he have to pay you for that? Something well, here's what that. happened. He's, he saw me doing the lean, right? Yeah. He stopped, yeah. He, he stopped everything. And he said, do that again. So we did it again. And he goes, I want to do that. And we all had to get harnesses. Yeah. And, and it was a harness. <laughs> yeah. It was harnessed with the wire coming out of the back. And we had, a, a, in our shoes, we had um, like a hole cut, cut out of the heel. We had like dress shoes on. Okay. And they put a metal slit mm -hmm. in there. And, they, you know, on a sound stage, the nail heads are about this big. So um, we do the move and we click our heel to the nail head uh, of the um, nail in the sound okay. state. Yep. Okay. And we could do the lean. It would go as far as we wanted to go, right? Now the problem mm -hmm. was getting back up. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> because then when, you, when, you, when, you, when you were all the way down, you couldn't, you had to like, uh-oh, your, your body had to say, okay, wait a minute, okay, right. uh oh now it's time to go back up. You couldn't do it by eight counts because you couldn't predict what your body had to do before it would come back up. So um, Quincy Jones was, would come in every day and play a new mix, you know? And like for the pool room section, there's a new mix for that, for this, mm -hmm. right? So it was wow. just like the old musicals. And so when he saw the lead, he's like, well, what's the count? Well, there is no count. What do you mean there's no count? So basically they had to do a tape stop and just play it by ear and put some atmosphere in it, you know, to, Oh, so they come back up, and then, then we went boom, boom. <clears throat> so that's when they brought the beat back in. That's why it's kind of not on the beat. Got but it. it. But it doesn't matter because it's a complete stop. Right. That's right. And, um, yeah, it was really cool, man. And then uh, we were all doing the lean, and then they decided it might look better with five instead of six or seven of us. And then so I got put out of it. But I filmed it as well. Mm. And then I got put so Sometimes you can see... It looks like there's five, and sometimes it looks like there's seven of us. So, and, um, um, but it was absolutely amazing, man. Absolutely. Which amazing. one, which now in the scene, are you on the right side or left side? It's hard to tell because I've got, the, we all, if you notice in the choreography, we're all like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Everything's like this. Dum, 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 dum. So, the way you can tell it's me is with the, all the bushy hair coming out of the back of my hat. All right, look okay. bushy. Yeah, the afro. And I've got the, well, but mine, you know, I'm mixed race, so mine is bushy, bushy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mine isn't. Mine, mine moves. Where the tight, there's, no, there's other guys with tight hair behind, but mine's really. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, it was, it was really exciting. And then, um, but when uh, when we started the work, it was just the 18 principal dancers and Michael. Yeah. And yeah. Michael's best friend was Marlon Brando's son. Who's this big guy? Weighs about three hundred and fifty pounds. You know, Marlon Brando. People don't know he's Mexican. Marlon Brando's Mexican. Oh wow! So his son looks really Mexican. <laughs> Just like straight, straight walked across the border yesterday. Right. And uh, but he grew up with Michael, so uh, they're best mates. And Michael is not feminine. He's obnoxious. They would wrestle and fight, you know, and stuff. And and he would come with Bill Bray. Bill Bray was the first black police chief of, of Los Angeles. Mm. Right, and right. the Jacksons came to Hollywood. Barry Gordy put Bill Bray in charge of the Jacksons. So Mike, he was like Michael's grandfather, you know. Mm, right. And uh, Bill Bray, and Michael would attack him and, and play with his ears. I guess he used to play with his ears as a kid. And he yeah. had huge ears, grandpa ears. And uh, but the cool <laughs> thing was, uh, we, it was just, it was 18 dancers and, and with Michael and the choreographer, um, I got pegged to be the choreographer for the street dancing. Mm 
Okay. Because Jeffrey Daniels was away, and then uh, like from right Shelmore. before we started filming, he shows up. Mm. Okay. Okay. So I didn't get I didn't get that timing time, is but, everything. Time is everything. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But Jeffrey is yeah. one of my best friends. Friends to this day, he's the most amazing guy. You know Jeffrey, right? From Shalimar. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't know him personally, but he's always here. He lives in yeah. uh, Nigeria now. Nigeria and Japan, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. No, I was, I was gonna tell you, so um it was the eighteen dancers and us. Yeah. And then the first day of filming, now Michael would come, he would stretch with us and everything, and we're <clears throat> making stuff up for the routine and all that. Total wow. workshop and then a few weeks later, the first day of filming, there was literally like 150 people there. There was so yeah. There was a, that video was massive. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, this is the crew because you got yeah. first unit crew, you got second unit that do all the stunts. Oh, okay. Then you have the, the documentary crew. Then we have Bubbles, the monkey, and his crew because his course. trainers <laughs> and all that. Of course, of course, Bubbles has his, his own crew. Yeah. But then we had catering, the catering, and then we had for us. Oh, yeah, I like him. But then we had Michael's catering, which were yogis. Okay. And uh, then we had um, all of a sudden you got Joe Pesci on the set every day. Who yeah, Mr. Mr. Big. Mr. Big. So he's with Robert De Niro every day. So Robert De Niro's on the set. Corey <laughs> Feldman is on the set every day. Elizabeth Taylor, Patrick Duffy. Then Patrick Janet Duffy. And, the, and the brothers would come through mm-hmm. every other day. Then the father mm-hmm. would come through on days that Janet was. No, I think the, the father never came because Michael didn't speak to the father. The mom came, um, and uh, then every day, believe it or not, once we started filming, yeah, every day there was a high school there in Bleachers. Every day, a what? new high school, or it might have been two or three high schools chosen to be able to watch my school. And every day there was at least two kids on their deathbed. Literally, could have died right there. Oh, like a okay <laughs> last, last wish. Michael. Any- so um, every day there'd be some kid in there with tubes coming out everywhere and Michael saying hello, you know, and yeah. then watching us film. And uh, it was absolutely inc- incredible. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. And um, like uh, his manager at the time was um, was um, Frank DeLua. Frank DeLuca. No, Frank DeLeo. Oh, that sounds like one of them. Guy. Yeah, um, it sounds like one of them mob guys there or something. Yeah, he he was a mob guy, Frank allegedly. <clears throat> allegedly, and he's he Thank was you. in all those um, Goodfellas movies and all that kind of stuff. You know, I think he produced those films. <clears throat> but um, Frank D'Elia was Michael's manager at the time. Okay, yeah, he he was, you know, three four hundred pounds, big hat on, you know, smoked a cigar, wore this you know five thousand sure. pounds suit with a beautiful tie, yeah. you know. And I promise you, this is the funniest thing is we all thought. <clears throat> We, we all thought for sure that he was Mr. Big at yeah, first, yeah. you know. And then so finally I got up the nurse and said, are you Mr. Big? <laughs> I was oh, only like 18. He's like, no, I'm My not. best friend was Eddie Garcia. He was 17. Yeah. And he's like, 18. no, wow. I'm Michael's manager. I'm Frank DeLeo. And we became buddies. And then um, my car broke, my car got robbed, broken into. And uh, while well, I was there one week, so I had to put it in the shop. So Frank DeLeo would pick me up and take me to the set every day. Oh like wow! A week. What? What? Yeah, man, so nice. cool. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was it was a blast. And then, um, then suddenly, when towards the end of the video, when all the the soldiers were in it, you know, yeah. the troops. Yeah. yeah. There was five hundred of those. Oh wow! Or something oh, like wow. that, three hundred, yeah, yeah. whatever. I don't remember. So all of a sudden, we got three hundred new extras every day. Well, first there was just eighteen dancers. Then they brought forty extras in to fill up. The dance, the club. Then it brought these three hundred extras that were getting dressed in on the same outfits every day. That's right. Uniforms. It was crazy, man. YouTube. Where else are you going to get this behind-the-scenes information yeah. from a legendary music video? I had the video game. Oh, my favorite. Part, right. My favorite part. The guy hits the. He's he's on the billiard table and he hits the he hits the cue ball and Michael catches it and then he just squishes yeah, the yeah, cue yeah. ball and then pushes the guy <laughs> out the brick wall. I'm 10 years old going like, this is what I need to be doing in life. Immediately. <laughs> and Patrick Allen was there. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about that? Amazing. Hey, hey man, awesome. only the best, man. I know some powerful people. That's man. right. You know, 
but behind, they yeah. might be behind the scenes, but but they you know they made things happen for us, right? Love it. Right. Hey, Patrick, I love you, brother. Thank you for coming on the show. Love Thank you, you so man. much. That was an honor. And, and when and uh, get some and, global and, music out there and make some changes. Thank now, you, brother. And appreciate it. As soon as you do um, your own marketing and own distribution, well, if you do your own push online, just yeah. spend an hour a day. I know it's laborious, but you could really go viral with one of your songs, and and make make a set of precedents. But artists, us yeah, artists well, are too lazy to do it, and we want to be found. Mm -hmm. We say I don't have those kind of skills, but if you put your mind to it, you can do it. Anything, yep. you can do anything, and, brother. Yeah. yeah, man, and and. Uh, well, thank you, man, from all of us. And yeah, like, like I said, we can use your endorsement if we can get that from you. That'd be beautiful for me. It's a of course. change. Right on, brother. Right on, man. And and uh, w once uh, Ryan comes on this side, uh, yeah, uh, Tom is already down in Bournemouth, so I have to yep. bring him oh, to, one of, one, to one of your jam sessions at the on the Monday night. I'm down there so, a lot in in Havel, in Havel. So oh, One of my producers, Fraser Freeze, he's in Bournemouth. He does all the music now. All the remixes and stuff on Britain's Got Talent and all that. Mm. Oh, cool. All the for right diversity on. for all the dance teams. He puts on do, 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 do. and then when uh, they when they when they can't get clearance for a song, he'll reproduce the whole thing, with all original, wow. and then yeah. you can use oh, okay. it. Yeah, That's amazing. Smart. It's perfect, man. Hey, brother, I'll be in touch with you, man. I'll come down to see you. Okay. Okay, I'm waiting to see you. What? All right, much love you guys. Love, Thank you so Thanks much. Have you a great day. day. Nice to meet you guys. All the best, brother. Take care now. Right. Okay, take care, man. Thank you so much for watching. To stay up to date, please click subscribe and hit the bell. You can also join our group on Facebook and find us on LinkedIn and Instagram.